Hey guys, so today we have Janet Dooley of Stateline Canine joining us. Janet is a certified badass. She's been training dogs over the last 20 years for search and recovery, uh, police canines for detection, uh, narcotics, explosives, um, cadaver recovery, also protection sports. She's titled two dogs to PSA three. Um, but I'm gonna have Janet explain all that stuff because it's not my domain and she is the expert. Waiting for Janet. Hi guys. Hi Tracker. Hey Deadpool. Hey Johnny Bones. Cats knows dogs. Thank you guys all for being here. We are waiting for Janet to join us. Howdy, howdy wolves. Thank you. <laughs> Say hey. Janet, I see you joined. Hey. 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 Now How I'm... are you? Good. Nice to see you. Well, is it working on your end? Because I'm just frozen here, I think. Yes, it's working. Okay. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you? Good. Okay. Thanks for coming on. Yep, no problem. Thanks for having me. So you have a really, really impressive bio and a really long bio. How did it all, how did it all start? How'd you get into dog training? Well, I was kind of hesitant about my college uh, major at the time and kind of started just trying to think of ideas of what I wanted to switch to and came across dog training. More so, I looked in like the health side of things and then just the behavior really interests me. I had a dog that I tried to do everything right with and did everything wrong with and he had some behavior problems. So it just really struck my interest. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what started it. Awesome. Um, when you, I know that you have trained, you know, police dogs and you do the protection sports. Um, what side of it is your favorite? Oh, man. Honestly, I mean, I really like kind of for the personal side. Um, I love doing the, the competition. It pushes me. I'm competitive. Um, and it just keeps, I don't, I don't like to kind of keep doing the same old stuff. I like better through more knowledge. So that really forces that um, for me. But I really, out of every, you know, I still really like dogs, you know, I still really enjoy helping the pet dog owners and seeing the improvement and, you know, in those dogs, because, you know, they're a lot of those owners are just lost, you know, mm -hmm. they don't know how to help their own dog. Mm -hmm. So aside from what you do um, with the pet training and state line canine, I know you also do, you're the East Coast director for PSA. Yep. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, I kind of fell into the position over the years just with the involvement in the sport. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of my involvement in PSA, it, it was, you know, as the sport started to grow and I gained experience in the sport, I just, um, I did what I could to help to give back to the sport, right? That gave me an opportunity to do some really amazing things and challenge myself as a trainer. And um, so whatever I could do to give back to the sport is, is really kind of what started lining up that, you know, me becoming a judge in PSA, becoming the director for, for the East coast. Mm -hmm. So to, compete in PSA, uh, what do you think are the key factors in, um, for the handler and also for the dog to be successful at it? Um, I think just, um, you know, ac accepting failure um, to, to gain from that and just dedication. You, it's something you, you can't give up easily. You can't let defeat take you down too much. Um, and that's, you know, if you have that mindset 
and you can accept failure and learn from it, you're, you'll, you'll do well in the sport. Mm -hmm. Um, when, so you've, you've had two dogs titled? Um, two dogs to, um, to a three. Yeah. Okay. Can you, can, for people that don't know, um, what PSA, can, can you kind of go through it like PSA for dummies? Okay. Yeah. So PSA, it's an outlet for, um, protection sport. So it's a combination of, you know, obedience routines and, uh, you know, it, it requires you to, sh to show control of, of your dog and, even in obedience, it's going to put your dog through through a lot of pressure and a lot of distractions and uh, and whatnot. So you have to you have to prove that, um, and the difficulty increases as you increase with each level. Um, same with protection. So it's you know it's an outlet for protection, and, and it's a scenario based suit sport. Um, you try to throw some realistic scenarios, like, you know, you said like the carjacking handler attack, um, things like that when it comes to protection, um, handler protection, and then, you know, the, in the difficulty of what the dog has to work through with distractions, um, and pressure just increases in, in the protection side as well. Um, and in the upper levels you get, um, compared to some of the other sports, um, where it, you know, at certain levels in PSA, there's a routine. Um, you know what to expect for the most part. Um, you know, some of the distractions and some of the small things will vary a little bit. Um, but, you know, once you get to the higher levels, you know, you're especially level three, everything's a surprise. You have no idea what your dog, what you're going to have to do for your obedience routine that day until the day of. Same with all your protection scenarios. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So when you say a routine, what kind of routine are you talking about? So when you say like the obedience is a con you know con consist of you know mostly healing. It involves turns, change of paces, um, stays, obstacles, those types of things. You, you piece those together um, along with distractions and, and a certain pattern. Right, the judge is going to ask you to follow a certain routine and pattern for these th these skills. Um, to pass in PSA, you have to get 75% or better um, in obedience. Mm -hmm. And then protection, you have four different routines um, that you have to pass. Um, so each routine can consist of a scenario, an example. It, you know, it can be what you know, we call um, a courage test, right? Dog and decoy just kind of run full speed at each other, right? Um, it, with different variables, and um, handler attacks, it could be a call off, right? So now you got to send your dog down the field. And now you got to call them off the, this decoy that um, is kind of taunting them down the field. Um, so there's four different um, protection scenarios in each level that you have to pass with a 75% or better. Mm -hmm. And um, why, uh, I know in some of the, in the levels, you have to do it twice. Correct. What's the reason for that? Um, that's just to, um, to show that you've, you know, sometimes with, with a surprise, it, you know, and it, it still is a, a little bit of luck in the sport, especially in the upper levels and what you're going to get. Um, but it allows you to prove, you know, some level of consistency and, you know, proofing that your dog has more strengths than just those, you know, four surprise scenarios that you happen to get that day. You can do this twice. Um, you know, it doesn't, we don't have, you know, right now the sport doesn't have a, a ton of judges, but a lot of people like to do it um, under a couple different judges and would be mm -hmm. surprised if someday, you know, that would be a requirement, right? Mm -hmm. um, just because different judges throw different, you know, surprises and different skills out there that uh, vary a little bit. Mm -hmm. How many judges are there during a trial normally? Uh, one judge. Just one? Yep. Except at our national event, we will have a judge assigned to each level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you, th one of the questions that we got was, um, do you think that there, um, do you feel PSA judges are consistent in their marks? I do. Yep. Um, we all like, so, you know, sometimes you see a, a slight variance in, you know, one specific, you know, you're talking to 
two three point exercises they might score slightly different but you combine those you know few exercises that av that total together is really close mm -hmm. um and we actually keep stats and stuff like that so of passing rates and scores and you know really the judges are are very close um as a whole and what they you know what they put out each year mm -hmm. which is really interesting you know it's nice to see mm -hmm. Do you find that there is any, uh, let's say, dog nepotism in the sport? Like, say, the judges, uh, you know, dog, it's uh, like that they're related, you know, like the, the judge's dog, um, like, had a dog and then, you know, so-and-so is competing with that dog and, you know, you obviously are going to want to root for your dog's dog. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when people have asked me just, you know, because, you know, especially the, in the sports growing over the years, when I first started judging, you know, you can't avoid, you know, sometimes you can't avoid people, you know, right? Yeah. Avoid dogs that you're familiar with. Um, and I, you know, my answer was, you know, for me, it it's easy to just judge what I see in that moment, right? You know, I'm so focused on, you know, where's the dog in, in the heel position here? Where, how was that sit? How was this, you know, each specific piece has a score. So for me, I always, you know, I always tell everybody it's, it's easy for me to just score what I see. It doesn't matter, you know, who it is or what it is at that moment. You're just really focused on what, what's in front of you. Um, and I think a lot of judge it, you know, you really just get a, a kind of tunnel vision in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. I know I say, I mean, you have integrity or don't, you know, and I, I think our, judge, our judges do. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Good. Um, okay. Um, what are your thoughts on, this is from Marlo, what are your thoughts on Schutzen in comparison to PSA? Um, I, my, I don't have a ton of experience in Schutzen as far as I've not trained for it. Um, I've watched and tried to learn as much as I can about the sport. So, um, but I, my take on it is, you know, you're really training for a lot of precision um, in Schutzen and it's, it's a different art of training, um, but also very challenging in its own way. Um, so you're just really looking, you know, you're looking for different things. I mean, you're really perfecting as, you know, you're getting, certain skills as flawless as you can um and you, you're looking for some of that in psa but there's so there's so many variables and there's so many pieces just to to create you know the clarity to your dog what you're asking despite all kinds of surprises and all kinds of things they've never seen before to for them to decipher through that it, it's hard to ask for that same level of you know perfection mm -hmm. And um, what are the biggest skills that the dog has to perform in, um, in each level? Um, each, you know, you know, when you're going with obedience, yes, we need very consistent healing. PSA does require an attention heal. So they want the dog's attention on the handler. Um, you know, they want, you know, you want to see the dog excited about doing the obedience right not flat look, very looking mm -hmm. you know drivey and, and excited in, in that obedience routine and there's you know a, a little mix of you know sits in motions down in motion stays um they have to be able to handle gunfire in the background um walking you know level one is is already a lot you know it's a field full of everything it could be toys balls sleeves big stuffed animals, other suits sitting in a chair that look like, a, you know, a decoy. There is a decoy in the chair. Um, so you're looking at, you know, piecing all that together and the dog ignore, you know, being neutral to those distractions. Mm -hmm. um, solid recalls. And then, you know, you get into the protection. You have a carjacking scenario um, where, which is performed on a hidden sleeve. So it's a very defensive you know, picture for the dog, for, you know, the dog stepping on the field in obedience and a controlled mindset. Now they step on the field and the first thing they see is a hidden sleeve and a really defensive picture, right? So it's, it's difficult for a lot of dogs to be clear, like, oh, wow, this, is, this isn't control anymore or 100% mm -hmm. control, but, you know, it, it, there is some protection here. Um, and then, you know, with that, 
um, you, we go into the um, a handler attack scenario, um, which is performed in the suit. Uh, there, and in the level one, I mean, it can be a lot of pressure, right? A lot of pressure and um, environmental distraction that the dog has to work through uh, for a beginning level. And the dog has to, you know, engage the decoy quickly, not show fear of the distractions. Um, you know, it, it usually if they're clear headed with that and taking that well, that means they out nicely. They have to let go on command um, and they have to disengage from that decoy, um, you know, cleanly as well. And, you know, then we you know, roll into the courage test. Um, and that's, you know, d decoy at dog. Um, decoy throws a distraction. So, um, you know, a lot of the prey dogs get excited about that. It's a bag toss, but the movement of some other object when there's a lot of commotion going on can throw off a lot of dogs. Um, you know, same thing. They have to, you know, engage and stay clear headed and release on command and disengage properly. Um, and level one has, um, surprise scenarios, but it's based on five, you know what it's going to be one of those five. So you can train for all five um, and be prepared. And most people hope there's one or two that they get because their dog's stronger at those. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, some of that's luck of the draw and, you know, that's where that second passing twice comes in play, right? The second time, maybe you may not get the, the surprise center your dog's strongest at. Right, but can you take the odds to draw a different surprise scenario, even at level one, and, and perform again with a passing score? Mm -hmm. Thank you for all of that. Lots of great information. Um, when you say that dogs learn in pictures, can you explain that a little bit further? Um, learn in pictures. Like you, you said, uh, like uh, like a scenario. Yeah, like. Um, I mean, I feel like you often hear that, like, uh, dogs learn, like, in pictures, like, they want to see the picture. And and you actually just said it before. Yeah, yeah. X, yep. Um, yeah, that's just, you know, going back, they're contextual learners. Um, so what is, you know, and I think that's the, you know, the non-dog trainers, the average person, that's where they struggle, right? You know, they think if a dog is familiar with something, um, they should just be familiar with it, even when that picture or that context changes. Um, but, you know, that's not how dogs learn. So they have to, they have to see certain skills and, you know, things that we're asking of them and um, teaching them in many different pictures. So they learn, you know, they call, you know, we call that generalizing, right? They generalize that it can, it can be applied to any picture. Um, mm -hmm. And struggle of PSA. I mean, that's really training multiple skills when it comes to PSA. That's, that's what you're doing, right? You're, you're mm -hmm. trying to general, generalize each skill that you've taught your dog in the clearest way possible. So when it is a surprise, um, you know, they can decipher what you're asking. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's what it, the struggle is. If your dogs just knew, if they didn't learn by pictures, they didn't learn by context, PSA would be easier. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I guess the reason why I'm asking you is sometimes I think, oh my gosh, if Rika, um, you know, if we get her on a, 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 obviously we haven't done any of this, but like biting somebody in a big suit and then we're outside and, you know, somebody's in a big winter jacket and a snow <laughs> pants, is she, she going to think maybe I should bite onto that person <laughs> or yeah most of, like you know that goes in context of you know their learning behavior of the person right I mean they're really truly learning what you know that behavior is what that context is and, and a lot of sport dogs can strictly be sport dogs you know they won't they won't protect a person you know just off the street because they don't know that um you know so they're dependent on oh you got my special training equipment you when you throw this on me where I were in this location then this is what you know this is what it means some dogs will pick up a little bit more on behavior of the person like oh this is kind of a threat this you know it's the behavior of the person um you know if a dog is you know most of these dogs uh, are gonna put several pieces together and not just go oh my gosh there's a bulky coat right mm -hmm. 
Um, now there are Malinois that are a little bit more high strung or high drive. So mm -hmm. they get excited over the smaller things. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, okay. Advice for female handlers in predominantly male handler sports. Um, I would say, I mean, I honestly, I personally don't even think about it. You know, I mean, I just train my dog. I focus on doing the best I can. Um, there's actually a lot of, you know, advantages to being a girl in, in handling a dog. Um, it's our girls can get frustrated, but, you know, sometimes we're a little less, you know, dominant in our personalities. Um, so that when a dogs are, when dogs are learning new things that can reduce their stress, right? Having, um, a less dominant figure adding, you know, sometimes that dominant, you know, posture and the dominant, you know, behaviors that some males have, you know, can create stress when the dog's already under a little bit of stress of learning, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we tend to be a little bit better at praise, right? Mm -hmm. Most guys aren't naturally good at praise. They really have to practice at it. Um, mm -hmm. not, they'll do a great job, but I would say in my experience, most guys don't start off great <laughs> where mm -hmm. girls usually are nat pretty natural at it. So there's definitely advantages to, to being a girl. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a lot of girls, ha you know, have success in the, you know, as handlers. And I, I think that's why. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. <clears throat> um, what do you think is the most challenging part of the sport? Um, that there's not one right answer. You, you know, a lot of people think, you know, because I, you know, I trained one PSA three dog, I might know, I might have the answers to a PSA, you know, of getting there. But dog number two is completely different, right? I've had, I've handled a couple other dogs in, in titling to a one, you know, in a one. Um, and it's, you know, those dogs are different. And, you know, now I have two more dogs I'm preparing for the field and they're each different from each other and the first two dogs I had. So um, I think that's what it makes it difficult. You have to, you really have to work the dog in front of you and what worked in the past may not work. And it's, you know, so there's, it's not like, oh, I got the hang of this now, right? Mm -hmm. There isn't, there isn't a right answer. There isn't, you know, uh, one for everybody. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things that worked for Zuko that didn't work for Danny? Um, you, you know, with Zuko, a lot of his was he just needed a lot of repetition, right? And he was a little bit more, um, a little bit more cooperative and responsive. Um, where Danny would pick up on things a little bit faster. Um, you know, I didn't have to show him as many times. He'd connect the dots a lot easier, um, especially those pictures that we talked about, right? Danny would connect the pictures a lot faster than Zuko would. Um, but he was a lot of dog. He was, he's not a soft dog. Um, he's a lot of dog to handle. He's a lot of dog to reel in. Um, and he's strong. Physically, he's strong. So it was, you know, keeping that balance, uh, you know, Hey, I'm showing you all of this stuff, but you know, how do I maintain control over you? Um, it was, you know, so he'd pick up on some things easier, but now, you know, how do I, how do I keep your head in the game? How do I keep you focused on me instead of letting your drive get the best of you? Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about um, like the, the bite technique and what the judges look for um, when biting? Yeah. So what they're look, you know, what we're what we're gonna look for is a dog that you know commits quickly, right? So when we say that, it you know it's when it's uh, there's a defense to the handler or the you know the decoy basically makes the threat, um, and you know we want a dog to react quickly and engage with the decoy quickly um, is the first thing we want to see, um, and then the grip is scored. So we want dogs to have a full grip, meaning we don't want to see space between, you know, the suit and, you know, the back of their mouth, ideally, right? So as much as they can fit in that mouth. Um, and that's, you know, 
obviously we, you know, as a judge, you can't always see that the bite pressure. Um, but usually because the decoy's moving, they're putting a, we call a drive on the dog where they're in motion. Um, and you know, most of these entries for the dogs are at a distance, everything's moving quickly. So they have to bite with pressure or they're, you know, they're not going to stay on. Right. Um, so those are when, when the decoy is putting some distraction or pressure on the dog, we want to see the dog say, uh, remain confident, right? Not start to show signs of stress um, while they're on the bite. Um, and sometimes, you, you, you know, you can see with some dogs, as soon as the decoy adds a little pressure, their body language shows they're not as comfortable. Sometimes their grip, you know, comes out a little bit. Um, it, it'll change, or it'll move, you know, they'll shift their grip a little bit on the, the arm of the D on the suit. Um, so those are usually some signs of discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, what, any other body language like ears or tail or anything like that? Yeah, sometimes, but you know, some, you know, some dogs just, you know, I mean, typically their tails wagging in a scent, you know, in, in that sense. So um, typically you're, you're really looking at the grip um, and, you know, a lot of prey dogs, will kind of thrash in the grip a little bit um just like you see dog you know any prey driven dog it can you know be any dog that picks up the toy and they thrash it around a little bit you know that mm -hmm. it's, it comes from prey drive so some of your higher prey drive dogs will do that and it doesn't mean that's not a sign of discomfort right you're usually looking at that that you know trying to move away from the, the pressure wherever that distraction is you can kind of see their body shifting their grip shifting mm -hmm. those are the really the main things that you're going to pick up on mm -hmm. awesome thank you for that um what are your thoughts on um protection sports dogs being pets like, can you have them around families or around kids i mean i'd say it's almost like any dog any other dog, some average pet dogs, you know, whether they're a mix or um, a purebred, you know, regardless of, of breed, some just don't have the right temperament. Um, mm -hmm. And these dogs, you know, typically, I would say the majority of them, they're bred to be a little bit more stable, their nerves are a little bit better. Um, they're typically a little more clear headed. So some of these dogs actually do a little bit better. Um, mm -hmm in a household, um, you know, because you kind of know, you know, where their lines are, they, they don't, little things don't get to them. But some are just, you know, I mean, maybe they have a little more drive, or maybe they're a little bit too dominant. Um, maybe they do, you know, some resource guarding. And, you know, you, ha you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I, in my experience, the majority of people that are in sport, whether, you know, it's any sport I know, French ring shuts in, um, any, any of the rings and PSA, that's a lot of them like to have them a social dog, you mm -hmm. know, they like to have them with their families. Mm -hmm. um, I see Jared Wolf just signed on. He has a, he has a question. Uh, it <laughs> was, <laughs> what is your opinion of a dog barking in a guard? My dog has started doing it recently. Um, I don't like it because I don't, it makes me not trust the clarity and the cleanliness, you know, where the dog's head is. So in training, I, I, I can't say it enough. I always say, um, you know, where's the dog's head? Where's the dog's eyes? You know, where, where it basically where's their mind. Um, if, if they start a lot of them, if they start barking, then, you know, sometimes they can't hear the handler, but usually that's a sign that they're getting a little bit too pushy and you may not trust them as much to to continue to make a, a good decision um, over a period of time or with a certain amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. So um, Zuko is Zuko is Jared's dog's grandfather, yep. and yep. he started doing a vocal guard. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Any advice for him? <laughs> um, I'm assuming this is an out and guard or unless you're teaching ascend into a guard um, vocally. So I'm not sure which one that um, we're referring to here, but if it's an out guard, I'd say quiet it down. <laughs> um, keep it clear. If it's ascend into a guard, um, you know, just know the dog's 
control level, right? I mean, everything I've seen with that, you know, particular dog is, you know, pretty clear headed. Um, and his control is, is pretty clean. So uh, with that type of dog, you can get away with a little bit of, you know, sending a dog into a, a verbal um, guard. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so this is a pet question. Okay. Um, why are there, uh, oh, how to build prey drive in a timid mouth? Okay. Um, well, you, ideally you want to start with them in you know, the most comfortable environment you can get them in, right? Um, wherever the dog is most comfortable is typically where their drive is going to come out. Um, and then, you know, the things to keep in mind is with, with prey drive is, you know, it's a desire to, by definition, it's a di desire to chase, catch and kill. So something that's going to have enough movement to bring out that prey drive um something when they do catch it it's more satisfying or you know i say it makes the dog feel confident if it's something soft enough or has a little bit of feedback right sometimes like something too flat like a flat stuffed toy is not enough feedback for the dog right even though mm -hmm. it's soft um sometimes like uh, the balls like you know um that are soft enough to that's why dogs like tennis balls right they have a lot of a lot of give but they're not completely flat um i prefer like um like the green star mark balls um or like planet dog toys that are real soft um but they're a lot safe you know they're, they're safer for the dogs um but kind of whatever you know you have to go with what that dog is most comfortable putting their mouth on um and that item also has to have continued feedback from you. You know, it, it, I'm hoping and I'm assuming if the dog's a little bit timid, um, there has, you know, there's a level of trust with the individual that's working with the dog in a, in a comfortable environment. Um, you know, keeping that, that movement and that prey alive a little bit once the, the dog is engaged with it is key, right? Um, a lot of confidence, not kind of commanding the dog to let go maybe trying to, you know, a second one to draw their attention with movement. Um, so the dog's always, you know, kind of winning in the fight, um, in a sense, um, but more so getting, you know, some feedback and reaction from that, you know, from that prey item, mm -hmm. right? Um, sometimes people, you know, they'll see the dog get excited a little bit, and they're really quick to add a little bit of control, add some commands in there, and it's a it's too conflicting for a dog that's especially a dog that's already timid um they probably don't like to mess up either so um and, and do the wrong thing so it's more of you just kind of have to redirect the dog if you think they're getting a little bit too excited versus you know instead of trying to put control on the dog right mm -hmm. um, the dog has to feel a sense of you know to free to for some freedom to to let that drive play out a little bit Thank you. Um, what's up with uh, Malinois and the, the suckling? <laughs> I don't, I don't have, <laughs> um, I don't, <laughs> my dog has never done that, right? Um, as mm -hmm. far as the suckling goes. So um, I don't know if that's just an outlet or, you know, what the foundation of where the dog came from and what habits they've instilled or in a release of their energy or drive a little bit. Um, I haven't, I haven't personally had, you know, dealt with it. So <laughs> mm -hmm. it's just a personal thing. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. My nine month old German shepherd has a strong prey drive. Even he tries to jump up and gets really hyper for my children. What should I do? Um, I, one, you can teach the dog to, if, if you're going to use the prey drive, teach that dog to channel it in the right, in the appropriate way, right? Have certain toys, um, certain times where that dog gets to channel that drive um, and kind of, you know, mentally and physically exhaust a little bit um, from that. And um, you can have a clarity of this is, you know, this is the time to do this. This is when it's done. Um, you know, and then in conjunction with a dog like that, kind of opposite of the last dog we talked about that might be a little bit more timid, um, this dog can, can learn 
you know, there's a time for manners, right? A, a time to distinguish mm -hmm. that just because something else is moving or exciting is that's not my outlet for, for this drive, right? Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit of obedience or a little bit of control in that point would, would be really helpful. Um, but also, you know, don't, you don't have to always, you know, kind of smash all the drive that dogs have. You, you can teach them to channel it with, the proper outlet, you know, uh, playing, you know, playing ball, playing tug, um, you know, kind of whatever is floats that dog's boat, you know, what drives that dog, what, what is, what prey items are, are really um, exciting to them. So, so you don't suggest creating the kids like Deadpool decoys. Right. right. <laughs> Create the kids. Right. <laughs> um, <gasps> What is it like, um, like or how, in what capacity do you and your husband, it's Sean, right? Yeah, yeah. Sean, uh, so you guys both work with dogs. How is that um, like, you know, being married to someone that you semi work with or, or how much do you work together? Um, I mean, really when it comes to, you know, working dogs or the PSA training, we, we do a lot of work together. Um, and, you know, there, obviously there's times I think we kind of, you know, we, we might clash a little bit in our opinions, but for the most part, I mean, that, you know, the bite works kind of his, that's, you know, his passion building the, the dog strength. And I have a lot of experience with it. I can do it. I can coach people to do it. Um, it's not the highest on my list. So for me, it works out kind of perfectly that he's amazing at it. He, it's his passion. Um, and then, you know, I, when it comes to more of the obedience and the control work or, you know, problem solving and in, in some of the other areas, that's where I, I you know, I, that, that's my passion. That's what I like to do. So um, it's, it, it works for us. It works out really well. Mm -hmm. Very complimentary skills. Awesome. Um, okay. Thoughts on direct versus indirect rewarding for the HRD canines and getting a solid TFR? Um, Before you answer that, can you just bring, um, I, I don't know what this I don't know what I'm referring to with the TFR. Yeah. Um, the indirect and direct reward would be, you know, like you're directly rewarding the dog at the source, um, you know, would be my opinion on that. And then an indirect reward was, would be the dog leaving or, you know, getting that, maybe throwing the ball off to the side or, you know, say if, whatever the reward might be. Um, so it, everybody has their own little bit, a little style now and, and it's hard. I've always, I've always done a little bit more of a direct reward um, on that, you know, with, with detection dogs. Um, and I know a lot of people use like the marker training or some clicker training now for detection. It's kind of grown, um, in popularity a little bit, but it's, you know, some dogs, you know, especially police dogs with cadavers and search and rescue dogs, you're, you're probably having a little bit, you have more time with the dog. Um, so you can probably, you know, with those dogs, you can kind of play around with, with what works and what, you know, specifically how the dog's responding. Um, you know, a lot of that can depend really on the individual dog. Some police dogs are just, they're strong and their drive is just a little bit crazy. So, um, you know, sometimes taking the time for marker training and stuff might, you know, be a little bit more of a challenge than it's worth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how to stop biting rough play with a German Shepherd when it comes to small dogs? Um, with, I mean, there's, you know, a couple thoughts on that. Your, I, I would guess or, you know, check first on, you know, how is that dog with dog, other dogs in general, right? Does that dog actually, you know, have the opportunity to gain proper social skills, um, you know, um, good manner, you know, good manners and, and, um, you know, community, uh, yeah, play behaviors really with the other dogs, right? Are, are they doing that with, with other dogs? Um, 
maybe some dogs that are a little bit more equal to their size that they can, you know, learn from or teach them a little bit better. It, you know, if that's the case and it's, you know, it's just small dogs, then I don't necessarily like to correct the behavior, but maybe just recall the dog out of the circumstance. Um, and they'll just kind of learn if I overdo it a little bit, then, um, you know, you're just going to call me away from, you're going to end my playtime. Um, so start to kind of learn some boundaries, but ideally, you know, get that dog as much as experience as possible and, you know, learning some proper play skills, um, with bigger dogs, um, you know, that can give them a little bit better feedback. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You touched on this a little bit before, but I want to ask the, the question that Harlequin asked. P okay. does, um, does PSA make a dog too dangerous as a family member? Are there similar sports minus biting? Um, no, I mean, PSA is, I mean, like most people will say, you know, sport dog is a sport dog, right? I mean, it's really context, it's context, right? This is the picture that I do this. There's a lot of PSA dogs that, you know, may not really protect in real life without, you know, um, without seeing that picture or being trained for that specifically. Um, and, you know, like we did talk about earlier, I mean, it really is going to come down to the individual dog, but most of these dogs, when they're on a PSA field, they're, they're high and dry. I mean, they're, you know, they're max in drive and adrenaline basically. And if they can keep a clear head and, they're not coming after the handler. They're not going after the judge. I mean, they're super clean. They're clear. Um, those are actually pretty reliable dogs. Um, so that's the, you know, that's the, um, what, how I look at it, you know, and personally it's, I mean, you know, Danny is, you know, the, the latest dog I had as a PSA three and, He's a strong dog. I mean, when he was young, I mean, I had to mentally prepare myself to get that dog out to work him. He was exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, but in the house, when he's not in that state of high drive and work mentality, he's a different dog. You know, I mean, he's amazing with, you know, with my daughter. And he never, he wasn't raised with kids. He was mm -hmm. five when she came around. Um, she can dress him up. She can pretty much kind of do what she wants to him and he just soaks it all up. So he's a, he's a very stable and clear headed dog. Um, mm -hmm. even though he's a lot of dog and drive, but again, he's mm -hmm. always been very clear on, I don't lash out at people. I don't show aggression to anybody. I mean, he doesn't even bark in the car or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a pretty chill dog, but you know, on this, on a trial field, he's, he's a beast. Right. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, they're going to cross the lines and, you know, but if it, if a dog does struggle with that, they're really not going to be a good candidate for the sport dog anyway. Um, there are sports. I'm, I'm pretty sure American shuts in, which is kind of under the PSA umbrella, but it's don't, you know, on sport, they do have an obedience title. Um, so you can, um, do that some of you know like shuts in which is you know igp now i i believe is what it's referred to they have like tracking titles uh, most of them have like a, a basic obedience title as well so you can get those without um, a protection mm -hmm. and what is um life like at home with danny and your daughter is he in the crate or is he just out like a regular pet um yeah he's out um, he's been up a little bit more because she got a cat for Christmas. <laughs> um, oh. and we're kind of easing them in, into things, but, um, and uh, up in the crate, he just hangs out in the room, you know, when mm -hmm. he's not out, but, um, especially as he got older and now he's retired. I mean, that's pretty much what he does. He hangs out in the house. Um, and you know, it's one of those things it's, regardless of how good he is with her, you always have to be responsible and like, you know, what, what's fair for him, you know, um, keep her on track of not doing things that, you know, can he can perceive as like unfair to, um, but yeah, I mean, she just, it, you know, depends on her mood. Sometimes, you know, I've come home from work and he's there and he didn't come with me that day. And I walk in and he's 
running around the house with a necklace and a tutu on and you know I'm like why does everybody act like this is normal right now <laughs> I did uh, you know up and you know there's times where I've caught her I mean really young I've caught her like you know and she just thought his breath stunk and she's trying to brush his teeth and he, <laughs> Right. So it's, you know, he tends to follow her. He loves attention. Um, he's pretty needy of attention. So he's, you know, he'll, he'll follow her um, around a bit. And, you know, sometimes they're like siblings. You know, she said, Mom, Danny, don't let me. He's moving my chair. Or, you know, he won't let me pass because he just leans against her because he wants her to pet him, you know. So um, it's, it, they're, interesting it's always it's always fun Aww, that's so nice thank you for sharing the family home life aspect of it because yeah. um as an outsider looking into the to the world um it feels like there would be all these um like such rigid rules um for at home when you're not you know training or you know on the trial field and um it feels like it wouldn't really be normal at home. Like if, like, say if I were to get into sports, like, is my home life going to change? Like, can I like not be chill with Reagan in the house? Will, will she have to be like this all the time? Right. I mean, that varies a little bit. I'm pretty, I'm pretty strict um, while the dogs are younger just to, you know, you know, even if I got a pet dog, I would, you know, they'd be created more, they'd have a little bit more restrictions, like the first year of their life, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I feel like that makes the be a better dog in the long run, when, you know, just like, mm -hmm. you know, small children, we restrict them a lot more. And dogs, we tend to think they need all this freedom in the world by the time they're six months old, and they're so mentally immature. So they, you know, we set them up to make all these kind of mistakes. Where, you know, I, I'm a little bit more strict with that, but, um, you know, so like, you know, my dogs get, they slowly get time out. Um, so they learn that being in the house isn't, isn't crazy. Just kind of, you know, how you would with a pet dog. And once I'm understanding, like, they're really clear on where the, how their work is progressing, how their training is progressing, how their relationship with me is progressing, then, you know, as that continues to grow, they tend to get more freedom, Right. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I think all dogs, I mean, we working dogs, you know, sometimes people are like, Oh, what do you know? What are you putting the dogs through? And, you know, I look at it as just like, I mean, it's just like human athletes, you know, you're going to tell kids that they, you know, the kids, they love to play basketball or football or, you know, soccer or whatever it is. Um, you know, these dogs look forward to that, but you know, these kids, they can be kids and hang out with friends and, you know, be normal kids as well. And it's the same with these dogs. You know, this is, they love to do it, but I give them a chance to, you know, run around, play with each other, run around, you know, like just be dogs. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, I, I always think that's the fair side and, and it's what the dogs enjoy. You know, you want to let them be dogs um, and not have such a strict regimen, no matter what, yeah, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, what's your advice for people that are just um, getting started or looking to get started in PSA? Um, really make sure you have someone low, you know, close enough to where you are that, that can help you. You know, have somebody that has experience with the sport. Um, clubs are the best way to get, you know, to, to get involved if you can get in. And I know right now some clubs, like our club currently, it's full, you know, I mean, we get a lot of inquiries and I feel bad, but, you know, we can only have so many dogs, especially in PSA, you know, the decoys get beat up a little bit more. Um, it takes a little bit more time to train each one. So, um, you know, we have to put a limit on, on what we can have in to, to kind of keep it fair um, for everybody. <laughs> Um, but you know, it's find somebody close by that you're, you know, relatively close to, um, <clears throat> that you can make that commitment and learn, you know, you don't, don't go buy a dog and then contact a club, right? Mm -hmm. Don't just, you know, watch videos and think, you know, what dog you want, mm -hmm. go spend some time watching these dogs, 
Um, even if you have to travel just to see some different dogs and different people before you know what you want, wait and get somebody that might know you a little bit um, and point you in the right direction for a dog that might be a good fit, right? I see that mistake a lot. You know, people get the dog and then they contact, um, you know, the, the club or they contact, <laughs> you know, the trainer. And it's much harder because, you know, you, you, did you get the right dog for the sport? Did you get the right dog for you? Um, you know, that that's, um, it's always a gamble, but I think, you know, having somebody with experience can, that knows, you know, these dogs and kind of what is a good fit for a new handler or a certain type of handler um, in home life and, you know, and everything else um, <clears throat> is, you know, really the, the best advice you can get. Okay, thank you. What are your thoughts on um, a, a Malinois Dutch Shepherd as a pet? Um, I, you know, I, for me, I would say, I mean, I, you know, Dutchies tend to have a little bit more of an off switch, you know, um, you know, the Malinois, unless you're, you know, you're really burning their energy and you're giving them an outlet, you know, I mean, you really have to know what you have, you know, there's some Malinois that have a decent off switch, right? I mean, I had a shepherd once that I was like, you know, that you're like 11, you can lay down and <laughs> sleep or something, right? Um, you know, he was a good dog, but he just couldn't turn it off. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, it's not always across the board for the breed, but I think with the Malinois, like people really have to know what they're getting um, and they have to have an outlet. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to go out there and say you got to do PSA necessarily mm -hmm. with the dog. Um, I've seen, you know, I've known people that have Malinois and they do agility or they do a ton of hiking or, you know, they're distance runners and they just really give the dog a, a lot of outlet. And mm -hmm. you have to be prepared for that. Uh, you know, with a Malinois. Uh, I think someone just submitted something. Uh, from Persian Canine Club, uh, do Malinois also have show line and work line? Yeah. Yes. Um, there's definitely a, a difference <laughs> in the two. So kind of like most of the breed, you know, most of the breeds that have both. Um, another question on PSA, um, is PSA ever going to make a breakthrough in Europe? I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. Okay. Um, we're, we're at, um, an hour, Janet. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Can we, can I ask you a few more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, I was reading about Jero and the cadaver recovery. Yeah. What's, uh, what's training like? What's that experience like? Um, that's, I mean, that's really um, another one of my top areas of interest. Um, I think there's a lot to, oh, again, it, kind of similar to PSA, it kind of pushes you to keep learning. Um, you know, that area um, is, is the same thing. There's a lot of unknowns, right? There's so many things you can throw at the dog. Um, and just for, you know, learning experience and, and whatnot. So it's, um, but it's for the right person, you know, typically when you're working with a human remains dog, you're working with, you know, pieces of human remains, right? It's stinky. It can be gross. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you've got to prove dogs, um, you know, off of some animal remains and stuff like that, just for training records. Um, I've never seen it, you know, be an issue, but just for training records to, you know, to prove the dog has no interest in, you know, other remains. Um, so handling all that kind of stuff can be you know, not, it's not for everybody. <laughs> um, and then, you know, that part I don't necessarily love, but I love the training. Um, and it's, you, you see some unique things, you know, you get called out. I mean, I, because I worked with a lot of police departments, um, and, and most departments don't have cadaver dogs, right? You're not going to, you know, they don't want to invest that kind of money into a dog that doesn't necessarily give back. 
right? A lot of mm-hmm. dogs and stuff like that. There's a lot of Homeland Security grants and, and things like that to help. Like, hey, let's keep, you know, let's keep people safe. Let's, you know, um, make sure we, we have dogs to do that. Um, and, you know, drug dogs can find a lot of drug money. You know, there's a lot of investment coming back in, into the police departments. But, you know, cadaver dogs, you know, they don't really... They can give you um, answers. They can give you closure. Um, and, the reward's not as big. Yeah. So, it, you know, financially, it's not, and there's not as nearly as many, you know, situations to use them. Um, so, I, you know, I would get called with, you know, just departments knew because I'd worked with them. They, they knew I had a dog available. So, sometimes they had cases. Um, so, I got to call that, you know, I got called out to that, which was, um you know, I mean, it's interesting. And, you know, sometimes it's a little eerie. And depending on this, you know, what the calls are. Um, But, you know, for me, it's just to watch the dog, you know, that's a dog that you don't know, I mean, you could be looking for, you know, okay, an old case, right? Uh, something that's really difficult. You show up and someone's like, oh, it's, you know, they say there's a body here and there's 300 acres. And I'm like, uh, this dog can't, you know, so you, you never know what you're going to run into, but it's kind of like whatever you throw at the dog, these dogs, you know, have to, they got to work. I mean, and they got to work hard to not find anything and still have the drive to just keep going and going and going and going. Um, so, you know, when you, when you get a dog, um, you know, Yara was, was that dog that's, he, he lived to work. That's what he did. Um, and, you know, I knew kind of knew I, one time I had to kind of park on a mountainside and climb up a mountain. Right. And, you know, they were actually I had to like cut down some trees just to, for the vehicles to kind of have a place to go and we're, you know, hiking straight up a mountain. And then we, you know, get to the search area. So <laughs> this dog has to encounter quite a bit just to, to get to where, where the search is. And um, oh, he, he goes, he, you know, he'd always give it his all, right? That is so epic. <clears throat> I, that, that just, uh, the, the, the picture that you're painting just sounds really amazing and nothing like I have ever ever imagined how long do these like how does it work like it's not like how like what is the day like what is the session like like when do you know when to cap it like there's nothing here if the dog's just going and going and searching you really have to just kind of set boundaries and go off of you know the information you have Mm -hmm. um on you know what the area is um you know, if it's a large area, I mean, in that case, I mean, sometimes you have to go out multiple times, you know, over days and, you know, you mark your areas, you search. Um, and, you know, in that case we've had, you know, like anthropologists out. So if we get, you know, an alert or we get something, they start testing the soil. So sometimes it's a team effort, right? That, mm-hmm. you know, the dog can help, you know, provide some guidance. Um, same thing. I mean, these dogs can work on water. Uh, you know, and they have some sonar to, you know, look for a body sometimes, but, you know, the dog can help kind of narrow down, hey, this is where, this is where you should look, or this is where you should throw divers in. Um, so, you know, sometimes it is, a, it is a team effort, right? The dog is one piece of the puzzle um, and, and can help narrow some stuff down where, you know, by doing it with the other equipment, it just would, either it's not as, accurate or it just is going to take a lot longer mm-hmm. especially when you're covering a ton of ground right that's usually the case like you know not all cases you know but a lot of them you're, the dog's covering a lot a lot of area mm-hmm. um talk about how he would reward himself and search with his ball and his oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he um that's what he loved doing that so much he'd you know we would put out training aids and put out hides and he'd go you know he'd he'd alert on it i'd reward him and he'd run around he'd catch odor again and he would just work to source and you know work that scent cone find the source drop the ball hit the source alert and then pick up the ball on his own and start running around (laughs) yeah he um 
he definitely loved what he did. So that, it was funny. Most dogs would just be happy to have their toy or maybe go check it out, but he'd spit the ball out when he got close and make sure he did it just right. <laughs> and even on, <laughs> lay down on him on his own and then, you know, pick up his reward and keep going. <laughs> oh, so cute. Love yeah, it. He was fun. Okay, McClaskey, what's the best age to send a dog to your board and train program? What does your program entail? I like, I mean, I like having dogs, you know, between five and six months. Um, I think it's a good age. Um, and, you know, they have their vaccines or, you know, you kind of know how, um, how they're, they're responding to the vaccines and stuff like that. And then they're at a good age to really gain, you know, we put them with some other dogs. We try to, you know, start teaching them some social skills um, and just exposure of being away from their owners a little bit and getting some independency and meeting several new people. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a good age to, to start that during that, you know, um, that fear imprint period, give them some good experiences where, you know, the professionals can kind of guide them through that. Um, and then it's a lot easier to teach habits before their habits, <laughs> good habits before there's too many bad habits instilled. Um, so it's a good place that you need know, to start a foundation. Mm -hmm. And um, can you just talk a little bit about State Line Canine and what you offer and how people can get in touch? Yep. Yeah. So we have, I mean, we, we, Kind of, I'm going to say we do it all. We do a variety. Um, our pet dog program is still kind of our, um, we have the most dogs in our pet dog program. So we have a couple options. Um, the locals are lucky enough to, anyone local to us, um, they're, they're lucky enough to be, have the, the option of our day training program. So it's basically like daycare, except, you know, it, it's based around training, um, and so they get to drop off and pick up their dog every day. Um, and then anyone else that either their schedules just aren't, you know, don't match with that program or they're a little further away, we have an inboard program that's very popular. You know, we get people from hours away, um, you know, that come to this um, and they stay with us. And, you know, we, and we go through the, you know, we keep them the training. Um, you know, one of the things I like about, um, you know how we have things set up it's not just hey you're in the kennel you come out for training right we make sure they get time again just let them dogs let them run around um if they're dog social um you know or they're puppies you know you get you know structured play time um you know we have dogs you know we have regulars here we call them our regulars that have really good dog social skills and they're great at teaching you know young dogs how to play um, you know, some of our own dogs are good for that. So we can kind of, you know, we show them as much as we can. Um, and then, you know, we have, you know, a mix of, a mix of trainers. Our training programs are a little longer than some, but I, I like to take the time with a dog to kind of create a good, um, foundation, um, you know, in the beginning parts of the training. Um, so then, you know, any time after that or with, through problem solving, we get a lot of behavior problems. You know, we get a lot of aggression cases, shyness cases, um, things like that. So, you know, we like to spend a little bit more time on the foundation. Um, and I think that helps um, in the long run um, in the performance once the dog leaves here, um, as well as problem solving if anything pops up as they're transitioning at home. Awesome. So, yeah, and, and we, you know, we do a lot of, you know, we do a lot of privates for PSA. We do, you know, we sell protection you know family protection dogs we have police dogs come through here so we have we have a large mix we work with some search and rescue groups um so we definitely have a large mix of training going on um but i you know i i have a passion for the for that pet dog program and that obedience program so we keep that um you know we keep that pretty busy mm -hmm. awesome um it uh with all of your experience, like the narcotic stuff, the explosive, yeah. all of the um, police stuff, um, is there one um, like instance, one story that you have that's most memorable, uh, whether it was a terrible thing that happened, uh, like a funny moment or just oh. like you're, 
biggest learning experience? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it, I've, there's, there's probably so many, I mean, there's honestly so many, I probably can't even think of one. <laughs> like the craziest, like the craziest thing that you had to train for or have seen, like, I, I don't know, um, what so with the police canines are you tr you have the dog you train the dog and then you sell it to the police um yeah for some you know, some of those cases some they you know they come for training here for help mm -hmm. things or for for regular maintenance mm -hmm. um, it can vary a little bit um mm -hmm. <clears throat> man yeah i don't i mean it's a lot of that, I mean, I would say a unique thing as detection wise um, that, you know, I kind of had a, a last minute request for a tobacco dog, um, which was crazy, you know, it was super unique and crazy. Um, but they need, it was for New York City. You know, they had construction workers smoking basically on site and caught a fire but the water was turned off because you know they're taking down the building and a couple firemen um you know died trying to put out this fire i mean this was years ago um so they were starting construction companies were you know toying with the idea of like hey let's have a tobacco dog so you know we got to search their stuff before they go in this premises to make sure they're not going to be smoking up here in the building so um I had to find, you know, hey, where do I get tobacco leaves? Where do I get, you know? Um, and um, I actually, you know, my Yarrow, my cadaver dog, um, it wasn't in a area that it would conflict with his cadaver training, um, just in these construction sites um, at a checkpoint. So I put him in the two weeks time, he was out there working for a few months in the city. Um, yeah. That was, um, that was a unique situation and a really interesting take on using a dog right yeah, definitely i wonder what that was like a tobacco in the city with a bunch of construction workers yeah they just kind of laid out um they had like tables like a check-in right on site and so they had to lay out their stuff and uh, you know the dog would search it i mean obviously okay. if, it, you know, if it ended up being chewing tobacco or something it wouldn't have been an issue but um, that way, if they were basically bringing, you know, a cigarette in, then, um, they weren't, you know, a designated spot, they were allowed to have them. But if they were trying to enter into the work site, they had to lay out their stuff, the dog would search it and, um, you know, make sure they weren't trying to take cigarettes into the, um, the site, which they technically weren't allowed before, but people were breaking the rule and that, you know, that's how the, the fire had started. Mm -hmm. Very cool. It's amazing <clears throat> what the dogs can do. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. Zuko biting me. Is, was there a story about that? Uh, is that <laughs> Deadpool. Um, Deadpool. Deadpool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was when um, <laughs> I was still, I mean, I, I was in the threes with him. Uh, it was my first year in the threes, so I thought I knew how to do a proper muzzle check, um, and I didn't. So we were practicing a muzzle attack, which um, you can do, you know, sometimes a decoy stay suited for that. In this case, he didn't have any bite suit or protection on, and um, the muzzle came off, and he got a live bite. <laughs> so uh, handler error on, on that, but I definitely – since then have um learned how to do a proper muzzle check ah very nice <laughs> okay uh, last question for you janet what is the most rewarding part about what you do um just as the results that you know you you get with the dogs every piece has its reward you know every piece has its reward i mean I, obviously i like the competition um, you know, because it, it, it pushes me. Um, but that in itself, you know, that, that success is, is rewarding in its own way. But, you know, with, with obedience program, with pet dogs, 
I mean, just every single success story, you know, is just, it's rewarding to me. Um, police dogs, you know, detection dogs, when you're going out there and, you know, you hear that how they helped or they found drugs on the street or they helped find something that, you know, stopped something here and there. It could be anything, right? Um, tracking dogs, finding somebody. I mean, those are easy, obvious, re rewarding things. So every time, you know, and I think with dog training, you, you can get a lot of even small rewards along the way to every time you see the dog pick up and understand something, right? When you have aggression cases and, you know, the dog and that aggressive dog is now accepting, you know, affection or, you know, um, multiple people around the room and they're staying in a relaxed state, you know, I mean, all those little things are always rewarding. So I think it's like, um, with dog training, it's, there's just so many angles and pieces you can, you can get a reward. <clears throat> awesome. Well, I am very happy to talk to you and I've learned so much and I think you are very, very inspiring. All the work that you've done is really impressive. So well done. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'll, um, I'll post this and um, I'll talk to you soon. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs>